Oh, I'm. We can see it, Maria. In professional, I can you see the screen? We can. Yeah. Yes, excellent. Hi, my name is Maria Davidova, and I will be talking about systemic approach to architectural performance and about uh, the hyperobjectivity within uh, within uh, within uh, this field. Uh, if I okay, this is not working. Then I just scroll. Uh, I will just uh, slightly introduce uh, how do I work because it's it's a bit uh, untraditional. I am uh, actually hired at this moment. I am hired for time academician. It hasn't been always uh, this way, but in the same time, I am uh, I'm chair of an NGO called Collaborative Collective. And uh, that NGO also has a practice network. And uh, the work I will be presenting here today will be actually crossing those fields uh, that have been interrelated and many of the projects have been done through academia, integrating practice, integrating NGO or other way around. And that all can be classified to research by design. That would be through experimental teaching or studio teaching uh, to, to put it, uh, put it uh, directly. And uh, let's get to the discussion about hyperobjectivity. I'm sure many of the people here are aware of the work of, uh, of uh, Timothy Morton. So that's his term. So I will discuss why, why the systemic interventions, uh, which uh, has been done through, through this uh, kind of settings, uh, are hyperobjective. This is a just easy example of uh, Villa done through our practice. Uh, that was also integrating uh, students working on that, and a uh, lot of work has been developed through non-for-profit uh, practice. Uh, so this uh, this villa is uh, just simple object. It's just a house, right? You would say. But in the same time, this house is operated by artificial intelligence or. Uh, machine learning uh, that is operated by hardware that is co-designed through that villa and through that villa's performance, uh, how you behave in that villa, how the environment around that villa and within that villa behaves, uh, that, that is machine learning. It has, uh, again, interconnection with, uh, with uh, the people that can co-design and redesign it, then uh, you integrate again machine learning and that all develops. And then this design um, of the artificial intelligence called Sysloop is actually designed to be integrated in a large city system that would uh, work with, uh, for instance, th terrorist attacks or uh, let's say things like COVID at the moment. So that would be, that would be uh, different things that could interconnect those systems of those uh, intelligence uh, housing. This is something uh, which is a much largely not for profit work and that deals with ecosystem. This is projects called Colridor. And those uh, Colridor projects are doing uh, very small interventions, input like, uh, like insect hotel. In, uh, but uh, those insect hotels are placed on, um, on a larger network uh, that would be on uh, ecosystemic networks uh, within the cities, like uh, 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 bio corridors or bio bio networks. Uh, so uh, so the species distributes across the city, and you generate biotop on this network. So uh, then you can support the ecosystem. That would be uh, integrated with co-design and DIY. So you extend this network uh, to actually placing a QR code on that insect hotel to people to DIY those insect hotels and expand the network across the city. And that would be also integrated with several social events. So you generate the interest. So you generate habitable and edible, cross species edible and habitable landscapes and that work is generative because uh, because it's uh, it can uh, it can increase from one small thing like one small little object that is hyper objective. So let's get to the discussion on the systemic approach to architectural performance. Uh, uh, it is it is uh, it is focusing on uh, 
uh, landscape, social and culture ecology in built environment. And it uh, is aiming in a co-living uh, performance within the city uh, with uh, the aim of transition towards uh, post-anthropocene uh, that would hopefully target on uh, biodiversity and climate change adaptation. It is done through architectural and urban design, uh, whilst uh, using holistic approach. So that would be the starting field, but that field is again hyper-objective. And uh, that is because it is done through real life co-design laboratory. So uh, the work is not theoretical. We do real life interventions. Like when you think of reductionist laboratory, that would be you separate uh, everything from everything and research on one field. The real life co-design laboratory is the thing that you place the prototypes in real life environment and test them through real life and co-design them through real life and uh, uh, even redesign them through real life as well. So that would be an example of what, uh, what this, uh, this field is not about. This is, uh, this is from Cardiff, very close to the School of Architecture where I am, I am now working as a lecturer. And you have this beautiful butte park that uh, has very large biodiversity. Then you have fence, then you have, uh, then you have motorway, then you have a wall, and then you have uh, human settlements. So uh, what is systemic approach to architectural performance trying to target on is uh, that uh, species live, uh, live together in synergy. So people live with other species and other species live with humans and you don't have this, uh, this division like uh, people believed that uh, they are something different than nature. Of course, we are all biological bodies and uh, we are uh, deeply, deeply systemically uh, uh, dependent on, uh, on uh, the rest of the ecosystem and uh, maybe the ecosystem is also dependent on us. Uh, uh, we definitely have an impact on that. So systemic approach to architectural performance, it is, pro uh, it is kind of fusion of several process-based fields. I will just scroll down and then I will get deeply to them. So it is uh, systems-oriented design, performance-oriented architecture, ecosystemic or urban interventions, uh, time-based design, non-anthropocentric ecosystemic services, co-design and DIY. So if I get to systemic, uh, systems-oriented design, it, is, um, it has been founded by Birger Sevaldson and uh, he positioned the field that it is something between which very much relates to to SIO, right? Uh, this is something between systems thinking and uh, systems practice and something between uh, design practice and design thinking. Uh, whilst uh, this is processed through action research and research by design. And somewhat, uh, somewhat he put that point that is closer to design practice. Uh, I, I think it's very much interchangeable within, uh, within the processes. And uh, sometimes uh, there is more focus on uh, one, uh, one of those. Uh, however, uh, all those fields are integrated in that. And it is, of course, uh, dealing with reflections in action and uh, field of design and systems field design. Marie, I'm just going to interrupt for one second. Um, Stephen says he can't, your slides are frozen up now. Can I just see if anybody else is having a problem with the slides? Um, no, it looks like, uh, it looks like no. it's a, a problem at your end, Stephen. Sorry about that. Sorry to interrupt. Fine Marie. With I, think me. You, I think you should carry on. Thanks. Okay. Okay, so, uh, so uh, one of the tools of systems oriented design is gigamapping. That is uh, something similar to systems map, uh, maps, uh, but is design early. What we, what we say is very visual and it is, it is mixing, it is messy. We, we tend to be messy and we enjoy to be messy. And uh, we work with rich pictures, collages, user journeys, scenarios, diagramming, service blueprint, information visualizations, uh, uh, causal loop model, mind mapping, uh, but uh, also you can integrate uh, uh, different uh, scenario games and uh, things like that in uh, in all those maps and searching for, for relations and uh, 
the most messy you get, the, the, the best sometimes you need to organize later on, but uh, uh, we like to be messy. What I am working with in this field with is actually uh, working with minimaps and uh, gigamaps. Minimap is actually a small map which uh, every, uh, every uh, team member of uh, co-design process uh, has to first design their minimap, sort of map their own universe. And then they all go together to gigamapping and they are relating uh, their minimaps across the table into the gigamap, which also discusses uh, uh, empathy between, uh, between uh, the different stakeholders and uh, part takers. Uh, so uh, this would be like collaborative design or co-design that would be full scale prototype but, uh, placed into real life environment that would be reflected. And also what I'm sh showing here, this is not linear process. This, uh, this operates in feedback loops. So you, you gigamap together, you learn new from the new people, you, you uh, go back to your maps, uh, develop uh, your field, uh, then relate your field with uh, the other people. And uh, you are, uh, are full-scale prototyping together in synergy, reflecting, redesigning, and that goes on and on in uh, an endless process. Uh, this, uh, this is a small example of Gigamap of one of my students, uh, that students that have been relating those mini-maps of, uh, of within, uh, within our design unit when he has been uh, relating each mini-map and interpreting this, uh, this long list is interpretation of the relationship uh, between, between different, uh, different aspects of uh, each, uh, each team member. This is how it looks uh, in uh, co-design practice. This is my, my NGO practice project where we would work with uh, the community for uh, uh, city municipality of uh, Prague 22, where different stakeholders map their own minimaps. And this is example how uh, different students relate their minimaps across the table. Uh, searching, uh, searching for relationships. Uh, here they are asked to uh, develop one, uh, one synergetic, uh, synergetic design. This would be when, uh, when it gets to real public participation uh, uh, with, uh, with a variety of uh, community and people would cut those mini maps and uh, search for the relationships. Uh, we integrate physical objects, searching uh, relationships between tangible objects. Uh, that would be the urban interventions that would support the ecosystem in, uh, in this uh, case. Uh, and also dealing, uh, dealing with empathy in relating, uh, understanding, but also enacting, not only understanding, but uh, empathy is also about enacting. So this is designing through, through empathy that is understanding and enactment. When I get to uh, performance-oriented architecture, what I have been working uh, with would be mainly responsiveness and uh, that, is, that would be my PhD in responsive wood. This is example from Norwegian wood paneling. This uh, panel works when there is dry and hot weather and it gets narrow when uh, there is uh, uh, low humidity and uh, uh, high, high humidity and low temperature. So, uh, so this, uh, this screen is airing uh, when you want and uh, not airing when you don't want. And we would integrate this performance. This is a simulation how this uh, can, uh, can work, uh, uh, depends how the screen is open. And this would be my design prototype that is already integrating coliving with algae so that algae absorbs the moisture. So it works more when it's dry weather and uh, doesn't work the opposite direction when it's uh, high, high humidity. And that uh, would be integrated on, uh, on uh, screens that would, uh, that would support the ecosystem through uh, human buildings, architecture, but also non-human. This, uh, this is first application of this responsive food concept uh, uh, that is on a non-human settlement. This is uh, this is responsive insect hotel. 
and this insect hotel actually thanks to that that this wood uh, warps uh, being from different part of the tree trunk they warp different way it supports the biodiversity because it uh, generates different uh, different climates in different climatic chambers which means that different species have different preferences and uh, uh, then the larger diversity you generate to your design the larger uh, diversity of uh, of insects you get. If we get then uh, to the, those ecosystemic urban interventions, that would be that insect hotel, and you see how that inter intervention already generates some input in the environment. Uh, you see those people already suddenly are interested in uh, in the locality. That was actually a project that, that was uh, done also to generate social change to make uh, generate a public movement uh, about protecting this bio corridor so we made this intervention to make them understand that uh, they live in something pressure it is within the city center of prague this uh, this uh, this is iteration of the same concept uh, that's uh, from cyprus that is uh, just uh, by the by the united nations buffer zone and it is extending the biodiversity. It is actually beautiful bio corridor across the city, the buffer zone. It, it sounds uh, very awkward that there is something positive about having a bio, uh, buffer zone within the city of Nicosia, uh, which goes through the historical center and that, uh, that, uh, that part is just like bulldozer, but uh, it is actually a great bio corridor and we, we were bringing uh, this bio corridor across uh, the Greek and Turkish uh, Turkish part. Those would be pavilions using this responsive wood concept, uh, bettering urban heat island through the hygroscopicity of wood. So those panels warp and generate uh, airflow, circulation of humidified air, and again uh, getting uh, getting uh, change within uh, within the city, understanding. Uh, what uh, what uh, what are the ecological uh, problems now recent times people are starting realizing them the, the, those two projects are actually from the time people didn't understand it is too important and this would be actually very important part of this generating opportunistic use of so this blackbird uh, typically doesn't have where to sit in urban environment because uh, people would put the needles on their windows and so on. So generating city furnitures for blackbirds would be ecosystemic interventions. Uh, so uh, they do, those species don't uh, fly and uh, uh, die of exhaustion on uh, their way. I will just skip to to those. Those would be different interventions with uh, blooming species for pollinators and so on. Uh, getting to the time-based design, uh, this is uh, this is kind of uh, what you would do before starting the projects, uh, mapping the stakeholders, the first you have in place uh, with who you start your partnerships and then you make an action diagram who acts when and when the, the different actors have to act together and what do they do and when and uh, give a picture what is the project. Uh, very often it doesn't work but at least people understand uh, what do you expect from them and then you are getting through those projects to to building uh, getting public engagement uh, i mean we built an insect hotel but it is important to actually make an edible landscape for those insects so this would be workshop with uh, blooming species honey honey blooming species uh, and then again uh, public uh, public uh, engagement which uh, goes through this uh, insect hotel gets in inhabited by algae which it again uh, generates a more habitable and edible landscape across uh, across the species uh, and that leads me to uh, service design and non-anthropocentric ecosystemic services so that would be my colleague, landscape ecologist, uh, doing this uh, this workshop uh, with uh, with seed bombing of uh, honey blooming species that would uh, that would generate the service design edible landscape like fast food restaurants for the insects we accommodate within uh, within uh, within the hotel, 
and of course this uh, this hotel this insect hotel is in the same time uh, fast food restaurants for bats and birds uh, on this bio corridor so you interact with larger ecosystemic network and that's why those small objects are hyper objective so that would be just some uh, some samples of what we mapped what ecosystem uh, we we supported through this uh, and when we mapped this we would do uh, autumn event where we would uh, teach kids how to mix uh, mix the edible uh, edible bird food for uh, for the autumn because many people would be brainwashed and think that they could give uh, rice to birds of course not uh, uh, you use uh, you use uh, the species that uh, grow on the field because the species adapted for for what you grow on the fields and not uh, not uh, not on that and this would be another layer uh, exactly this is this is where is where is the insect hotel and this would be my ngo intervention actually being uh, being uh, like uh, a body that can actually fight uh, fight with uh, with the with the city or with the government uh, we put the uh, complaint on a city metropolitan pra uh, plan of uh, Prague uh, uh, show, clearly showing uh, this area needs to be kept green as well because uh, you have bio corridor going through here so so that uh, that would be why you need an NGO because if it's me Maria Davidova uh, complaining nobody listens when uh, when you have uh, uh, NGO but they, they actually have to have to sort of uh, at least give you an answer and have to deal with that so this is just sweet example from uh, from Cardiff about those uh, non-anthropocentric services. If you think of this, uh, this restaurant is restaurant for this lady, but it is also a restaurant for the bumblebee that is crossing uh, crossing the city. Uh, so so it has it has more services than uh, just one. This is how how nature is crossing across the city, generating its own uh, bio corridors. Uh, you can fight it. And this is nice example from Aarhus. Uh, this is from historical, uh, this is from outdoor museum actually. And this, uh, this little bird is living inside of the structure of this house. And my question is, uh, today many of the civil engineers are spending a lot of uh, lot of energy and a lot of a lot of finances on discover how to make uh, facades that uh, birds don't nest in them instead of um, designing for the facades which birds nest in them and we are all happy with that uh, because we want we want actually birds nest uh, nest in them uh, if I get to the co-design, co-creation and DIY, this, uh, this would be the villa I was showing at the start. So this villa is uh, uh, co-designed also the, the, the landscape and the ecosystem co-designed uh, co the villa, the ecosystem was extended on the rooftop and uh, uh, there, has been, there has been the terrain uh, defined, uh, defined the villa. Uh, that is actually sloping with the with the terrain, and it is co-designed through this water surface, which is actually critical for Prague, which suffers with droughts at this moment. So uh, these algae are uh, generating edible and habitable landscape with uh, with enough uh, enough uh, water for bed reservation, which is uh, nearby. It has been co-designed with uh, with the clients and multiple experts that have been co-designing for the artificial uh, intelligence uh, that again takes uh, takes uh, a hat and co-designs itself based on based on observation of what you do it goes from the fancy objects like uh, like a robotic piano that uh, that uh, the uh, the sensors uh, notice your mood and they will play what uh, what you want to listen in that mode uh, uh, it of course operates the climate uh, uh, the security and then uh, then the security of the city this uh, is a clear example of co-design when this uh, algae co-designs the performance of this uh, of this screen whether it's airing or not airing and uh, generates habitable landscape through 
to uh, some uh, sort of uh, semi-interior spaces uh, of the houses. Uh, this would be uh, a tree house that uh, stands itself, so it, it is not dependent on the tree in that sense that it is not hanging on it, by whilst it is attached to that, so it is dancing, uh, dancing with the wind, with the, with the trees, it is moving. And uh, th there is a moss growing on the platform, so we are extending the habitable landscape. In the same time, it's habitable landscape for us when we come and put, uh, put, the, put the fabric on the, on, uh, on the tea house. That would be only weekend, so the moss survives and it's happy when we leave. That this would be co-designed with uh, those kids uh, who were actually joining when we were building it. That's probably only possible in Ukraine where, where this workshop happened. Uh, so we were building and those kids were uh, telling us where to put the lock uh, to make it, uh, make it more exciting. Uh, these kids uh, co-designed uh, this uh, structure with, uh, with adding uh, blooming, uh, blooming species uh, for for the early pollinators and for the autumn, they were uh, just interacting themselves, uh, creating bird food the way actually they wanted. They got the workshop, but they they just took their way, which was which was good. So what we do is we are putting the QR code on uh, on those prototypes, uh, so people scan them and get to DIY recipes, uh, how to reproduce. Uh, those uh, those prototypes themselves this is a parametric model so uh, of course based on the size of the tree you change the parameters uh, uh, and then uh, then uh, uh, you you just uh, uh, laser cut the model or cut it uh, on a mill so this uh, this is what we do in uh, in uh, my design unit now i can just scroll a bit uh, when uh, when our students are making uh, diy videos for their ecosystemic interventions for extending extending uh, habitats uh, so that uh, that would be oh, it is it is loading okay so that's uh, that's some uh, some of the the interventions that are to support uh, ecosystem. Yeah, if I just go out of that, uh, what we are playing on uh, now with is actually with, with this co-design integration. We are integrating token economy, and uh, hopefully we will expand to blockchain soon. Uh, and it is with the discussion. Uh, I don't know if you heard of that New Zealand river that actually got a personhood. And personhood is something very different than, uh, than environmental protection. Personhood is personhood. And what we play with, uh, with, the, with the blockchain economy is actually we are wondering uh, whether if, uh, if a river can have personhood, whether it can also have a wallet and whether, whether different species can have a wallet, uh, which means that uh, uh, you, would, uh, you would pay the honeybee for, uh, for uh, the honey or for pollinating your tomato, and that the honeybee that has its wallet and collects the money can uh, then, uh, then extend the land for, uh, for blooming uh, meadows. Uh, uh, within this neighborhood. I mean, of course, you cannot, uh, cannot uh, make it in the system um, that the, the, the honeybee decides uh, I, I am buying the meadow now, but you can give a wallet to the, the same uh, way the Maori people are responsible for, uh, for uh, uh, the behavior of the river that has a personhood. The same way the system can uh, be responsible for the honeybee and say like, uh, okay, you you have to give some tokens to to the honeybee if you if you want to get your tomato pollinated, and that means uh, that if you collect enough money within uh, within the flying distance of, of, of the of the honeybee, you you extend the meadow for for the tokens you you collect. So we are wondering. Uh, how to make those uh, uh, 
uh, non-exclusive systems that would actually integrate the overall ecosystem uh, not being uh, just uh, top-down uh, human uh, anthropocentric uh, economic system but actually redefine the system uh, to uh, to uh, uh, this kind of uh, participation or community-based participation this uh, this is uh, just uh, just a sample of the project where we are already integrating this uh, token economy in uh, in uh, the practice uh, uh, within uh, that practice 22 where i showed that uh, co-design workshop uh, and then uh, getting back to we went through all those fields i discussed and uh, i will just show one of those giga maps i i did actually quite long time ago and i I just mapped several projects I worked on and uh, uh, sort of was searching for feedback loops uh, between different agency that is happening within within those design projects. This uh, this would be this would be the example. And what I came to was that uh, what was integrating more human and non-human uh, agency was actually like also most beneficial to humans. So. Uh, what, uh, what uh, I'm proposing is actually a transition from uh, discussing being uh, human-centered. Uh, I'm not sure how many of you are uh, aware of uh, this is like big thing in design, like human-centered design. So I think we need to move to non-anthropocentric design. And uh, this uh, means the transition towards uh, post anthropocene that would lead towards biodiversity and climate change adaptation. And that will be done through research by design. And uh, what I work with are those uh, ecosystemic prototypical interventions and their hyper objective relations. And this transition towards post anthropocene is uh, here uh, what has been discussed, uh, done through cross species co living uh, by generating dwelling and edible landscape, uh, uh, combining analog and di digital, therefore bio digital co design for adaptation and multi agency integration, interaction, and co design process of the performance. Uh, so I don't know how many of you are uh, uh, familiar with uh, Jan Gell. Jan Gell is a very famous uh, urban, uh, urban designer or urbanist that uh, discuss, has discussed uh, cities for people and it was great. However, I think we should now transit uh, from uh, that stage uh, towards the par participation of both biotic and abiotic agency uh, to one uh, co-performative ecosystem. Uh, that would be done through real life co design laboratory. And uh, those hyper objective media and agency are building the ground for the field that I discussed, which is systemic approach to architectural performance. So, uh, thank you. If you are interested in publications in the field, you can follow me on uh, ResearchGate. All my publications are open access. So, scan the QR code and uh, please, uh, please uh, catch up. Okay. Perfect. Th thank you, Marie, for a fascinating walkthrough in your practice. We have a couple of questions, and probably from a time perspective, we'll, um, we'll take those questions now and then do a time check before we move to Malcolm's uh, presentation, if that's okay. Yeah, fine. Mm -hmm. First one is from Jan. Jan, would you like to ask your question? Yes. Uh, I was I was wondering uh, how you uh, ensure the quality of the use of those different methodologies that you are introducing and combining. Uh, how do you ensure that there is a certain consistency in use of methodologies? How do you ensure? Well, that is, uh, I mean, like. Uh uh dancing with the system smuggling through i would i would i would say uh uh you don't you never ensure anything you do your best uh, i mean uh, uh how do you ensure i mean uh, i i don't think uh, the, this field uh, relates to any control and this uh, uh if you if i think if you deal with co-design uh, co-design is uh, perfectly 
not uh, not about control. It is actually I had I read very beautiful paper now by Harold Nelson, who was uh, who was just uh, just uh, discussing and it was it was actually sort of some uh, some sort of uh, in relation to Bela Banasi. Uh, he was uh, discussing uh, that uh, the true re leadership uh, should uh, should be participatory not uh, not trying to control because if you are trying to control everything runs out of control so if you if you integrate uh, you uh, i i don't think you you can uh, you can ensure no it's yeah. it uh, perhaps let me explain it a bit better i'm working in architecture too and mm -hmm. i work with the different stakeholder groups in redesigning uh, all the industrial sites. Uh, we always do that with uh, quite a large group of facilitators and consultants. And we have seen that if we use the same methodologies in a too diverse way, the kind of outcomes that you get from the different groups have a huge diversity. And the models that you're building are uh, simply uh, not fit to the situation anymore uh, because uh, uh, different uh, consultants make different interpretations of uh, what is brought forward uh, and interact in very quite different and diverse ways with stakeholders so you, you mm -hmm. get kind of, what you get is a mess yes but you need to then reinterpret everything afterwards uh, which is not participation anymore it is it is it is in a way true so uh, that's uh, that's uh, what we are discussing uh, designer as a facilitator or a role of the facilitator so you you facilitate the co-design workshop uh, you you need to work you search between synergy people like what what i uh, what i do through those giga mapping workshops is like uh, uh, asking people to interpret the relationships so they they first map their own universe they start to understand actually what they want which is very important first uh, before you start relating uh, with other people you need to understand what you want yourself then uh, they start relating uh, what they want uh, 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 what what would be the relationships between uh, between each other and then I ask them every every arrow they draw, they have to write an interpretation, and very often they have to dra uh, draw a scenario. What if uh, and also like catastrophic scenario, or what if everything goes perfect? What if everything goes completely wrong, and uh, things uh, things might happen either or or somewhere somewhere in between but they start to understanding start understanding and interpreting and maybe also giving uh, giving up on uh, on certain ideas okay thank you thanks uh, jan uh, patrick you had a question on gigamap Yes, hi Maria, it's Patrick Highland, yeah. Um, thanks, I very much enjoyed your presentation. Um, Maria, Maria, I'm quite keen on learning about new um, uh, methods for thinking systemically. So I'm quite keen on this Giga map method, which I wasn't familiar with. And um, I've just been listening to you talk to the previous speaker about how you use it in your workshops. Um, it seems to me to be a technique to be able to examine multiple different perspectives um, in order to arrive at a design. Um, I, I just wanted to know if there's any similarity with that, with uh, Peter Checklin's soft systems, rich... Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes, uh, yes. I mean, uh, we, we uh, typically Gigamapping works with uh, soft systems methodology. And what we have been also working a lot with is actually relating soft and hard data and uh, also being designer you also often have to uh, develop intuition and tacit knowledge so actually relating uh, hard and soft uh, soft uh, soft data and working uh, 
working uh, with uh, within within those fields uh, you sort of uh, generate that intuition of uh, of understanding and also uh, relating between different stakeholders you generate intuition and things like that sure uh, just briefly, I, I just wanted to follow on um, to that with, uh, you know, soft systems, um, w what I find is that out of those perspectives will emerge um, some some different strong opinions as to what, in your case, I guess it needs to be designed and for what purpose. Um, how, how do you juxtapose those different perspectives amongst the stakeholder group and actually manage those perspectives so that the individuals can I guess, accommodate each other in the SSM sense or um, get to some sort of agreement that this is now what they want to design when you have radically different views uh, with that gigamap method. That, uh, that, uh, that is, uh, that is uh, quite happening and is, is uh, not always successful. I will, I, I will not make you happy. It's not 100% successful. Uh, we, we try our best. That's the only thing what, uh, what you can do. But uh, the thing we are actually using as the design tool is empathy. We we just had the session. You can find it uh, find it on uh, on uh, on my YouTube channel. We had a session for London, London Festival of Architecture with uh, our Bar School of Architecture Masters of Architecture Design Program that has been uh, dedicated to empathy. And what is this relating uh, relating across uh, the giga mapping? And first of all, you, you map your own universe. With mapping your own universe, you also start understanding that other people have their own universes. Because you present, uh, everybody around the table presents their universes. And because you have your own, you start to understand others. Have. And trying to find the relationships, when you are asked to find the relationships, you are searching for synergy. I mean, uh, it. Uh, uh, you will never find uh, perfect, uh, perfect, uh, no perfect solution exists, right? Or anything like that. But, uh, but you can find synergetic solutions, uh, trying to going through different, uh, different relationships. And I mean, if there are uh, people who really hate, you, hate each other, and often, often those come, uh, I, I must say humor is, is a very good tool. You know, it's just like people, people are, are really at the table and some, uh, some of them uh, really hate each other and you just make a little joke about it. It's like, yes, we, I know you hate me and it's, it's, it's okay, let's, uh, <laughs> you, you know, so, so humor is actually very, very good tool to open mind and uh, people start opening their empathy to actually making little jokes about it. Yes, it is a difficult situation and nobody is happy at the moment. Okay, thank you. So th thanks for that question, Patrick. Just in the interest of time, if we, if it's okay with everyone, we'll move on to Malcolm's presentation and then come back to sort of an open Q&A with both speakers towards the end, if that's okay? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Um,